interesting we can tell from this out. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Let me know if you see my slides. Yes. Okay. So I will talk about gene prediction in eukaryotes. So while you've been introduced to prokaryotic gene prediction, I will now introduce how to do the same, but in eukaryotic genomes. And arguably this task is more complex in eukaryotic genomes for several reasons. And one of them is a different gene structure. So while in prokaryotic genes, the gene is defined by its start and stop, in eukaryotes, genes are comprised of exons and introns. And to predict genes correctly, the algorithm needs to predict not only gene start and gene stop, but it also needs to exactly predict the location of exon intron boundaries. And to predict the gene correctly, all the intron exon boundaries need to be predicted correctly. So in the final gene product, the final gene product is comprised only of the exons and introns are spliced out in the, uh, between the transcription and translation. That's one of the reasons why the problem is more difficult. Another reason is a difference in gene size. So notice that this graph is on logarithmic scale and the largest bacteria, only the largest bacteria reach about the size of the smallest of eukaryotes. And the same applies for the number of genes. So we have much bigger search space to predict genes in, and we also have many more genes to predict. And another reason is that eukaryotic gene organization is very diverse. So you can see that while some genomes are comprised mostly of protein coding genes, for example, as service AI, a yeast genome contains only 25% of non-coding DNA, the rest are protein coding genes. And on the other hand, the human genome, as you probably know, contains 99% non-coding content and only 1% of human genomes are protein coding genes. And this diversity is not present just between taxonomic plates, but it's also within taxonomic plates. So if we zoom in on the tree of life, of the, on the tree of life and only look at the fungal genomes, we still see a significant diversity for example, the average number of introns per gene ranges from on average one intron per gene. And I will show that in some cases, it's even much less than one. There are fungal genomes with almost no introns up to fungal genomes, which on average have up to five introns in a gene. So to account, to have an algorithm which can automatically predict genes in a novel genome, you need to be able to adapt to all these differences in gene structure. So to solve the problem of eukaryotic gene predictions, we have developed several prediction algorithms which are shown on this slide. And they start from GeneMark ES, which predicts genes from the sequence alone up to GeneMark ET, EP+, which can incorporate information on RNA-seq data and also on homologous proteins. And Last, we have a family of breaker algorithms which combine GeneMark with Augustus, yet another gene prediction tool. And they combine the strengths of both, both to achieve a better prediction. As you can see, all of these tools are quite popular. They are used by many users all over the world. Now I will introduce how the tool works roughly. So the core of eukaryotic gene predictions of all our algorithms is a hidden Markov model, which was well introduced by Dr. Borodovsky in the first part. But this model is much more complicated for eukaryotes than for prokaryotes, because you need to model the introns, exons, and transitions between them. And this model, the structure of the model, it looks the same for all genomes. What we need to adjust for each specific genome are the transition probabilities between these states, how long these states are. So most of these states come with an associated length distribution. We need to estimate specific splice side motifs, emission probabilities, and so on. So all these parameters need to be trained for each novel genome specifically because 
the diversity of the genomes is so large, parameter set trained on one genome will rarely work well on another genome. So this is called also model training. And most gene prediction tools handle the model training separately from the gene prediction itself. So traditionally in other tools, this is done by taking a manually curated gene set, which was independently compiled by some researchers. And this gene set is used to estimate parameters of the model. And then when we have a model to predict genes, then we use the whole genomic sequence, the model which was estimated independently, and we use this model to predict genes. However, you can see a problem immediately here that in case you have a novel genome, which you know nothing about, and you want to predict genes in it, you might not have a manually curated high quality gene set. So it's kind of a circular problem. So to predict genes, you first need to get a gene, gene set from the genome. And another problem could be that even if you are able to get a limited subset of genes for training, there could be biases. For example, if you select highly conserved genes for training, then your model will end up predicting mostly highly conserved genes and you are risking to lose evolutionary younger genes. So GeneMark ES is trying to approach this problem in a different way. And it's using self-training in the same way as the prokaryotic gene mark was doing it. And it predicts genes in iteration. So it starts with a very rough set of gene parameters, which are not very good, but they predict a set of genes. And from this set of genes in the first iteration, we use it to re-estimate the parameters again and predict a slightly better gene set. From the slightly better gene set, which is matching the genome of interest a bit better, we re-estimate the parameters again and predict yet a bit better gene set. And we iterate this over many iterations until convergence. And in the end, we will get a gene annotation. So I want to highlight that nowhere in this diagram was there a manually curated gene set. So the algorithm works just from the sequence alone. And you may ask, how well does it work compared to the supervised algorithms which actually train from a gene set? And this is shown in this graph when for three different species, uh, we are showing sensitivity and specificity of predictions over the iterations of self-training gene mark ES. So as you can see in the first iteration, the prediction accuracy is very bad. We are showing it for different gene elements for internal exons, initiation sites, and so on. And in the beginning, the algorithm has less than 20% accuracy, both in terms of sensitivity and specificity. However, as it iterates, it is able to in the end reach the same quality as the supervised algorithm reached. And in this case, the supervised algorithm was trained on an already annotated set of genes, which is also used as a ground truth for the evaluation, evaluation of the predictions. So to conclude, the unsupervised training from the sequence alone is able to reach the same quality as the supervised training. However, it doesn't need any manually prepared genes. And there are more details about the algorithm which make it work well. One of them is that we are using different models for fungal genomes and other eukaryotes. And the reason is that the intronic organization of fungal genomes is very different from the intronic organization in other eukaryotes because introns in fungal genomes have a very strong branch point signal, which is localized at a certain distance from the acceptor motif. While in other eukaryotes, the intron ends are usually recognized by a long motif around acceptors. So to model all of this inside of the model, each of the states I introduced in the big picture is actually split into more substates, which help the algorithm to model the gene structure more precisely. So for example, for fungal genomes, the model can decide if it wants to go 
through the fungal specific path with some probability or if it wants to go through the path which is used in most of the other eukaryotes and to illustrate how much this helps is uh, to show this graph which actually shows the improvements in gene prediction accuracy achieved with and without this gene submodel in fungal genomes so as you can see there are up to 15 percent improvements in terms of prediction sensitivity in how many exons the algorithm can predict correctly and i think till this day gene mark es for fungal genomes remains the best gene prediction algorithm uh, for fungal genomes there is and it does all of this without utilizing any external evidence but now let's say we want to use some external evidence and the reason why we would like to maybe use some external evidence is that the unsupervised algorithms like genemark es they can converge to biologically incorrect solutions especially in very long genes genomes with long intergenic regions so it can happen that the algorithm in iterations is actually not converging towards the correct result but it's converging to to something else and the larger the genome the more space there is for the wrong convergence so this problem is solved by semi-supervised learning and it also does self-training but in a bit different way it's utilizing information from rna seq or proteins to select a better training set in each iteration so the way the algorithm works it estimates the initial parameters from information found in RNA-seq or proteins. So it uses this to predict the initial gene set. And then it filters the initial gene set by information found in RNA-seq or proteins. And only then the parameters are re-estimated. So what I mean by this filtering is uh, we can look at another picture here. And in this picture, we will see a gene prediction by gene mark in at a certain iteration looks like this and in gene mark yes all of these genes would be used to estimate parameters in the next iteration however in the semi-supervised gene mark we would use information from rna seq or proteins to cross-reference our computational predictions to select the training elements better so in this case, you can see there is an intron, which is independently predicted by the model and found in the external data. So this intron would be used for training of the next iteration. On the other hand, there is another intron predicted, which doesn't match any of the introns found in our protein input. So this intron would not be used to train the model in the next iteration. So this helps the algorithm to filter out false positives predictions during self-training and converge to better solutions so now that we know that utilizing rna seq or protein information works well the question becomes how to get this external evidence from rna seq or protein data so in case of rna seq and algorithm which is utilizing rna seq is called genemark et uh, we need to map native transcripts to the genome and then directly use the entrance in training. So in case of RNA-seq, getting this kind of evidence is quite simple. However, in case of proteins, the situation is more difficult because you want to utilize alignments of cross-species proteins. But cross-species proteins are very noisy and the noise in this data increases with the taxonomic distance to your genome of interest and you want to be able to utilize very remote proteins because if you sequence a novel genome which is novel in a sense that no close relatives have been sequenced and annotated yet then the only information you have available for these novel genomes are only remotely related proteins and problem with proteins is that alignment direct alignment of proteins to genomes uh, in a way that you would try to align all existing proteins against all possible locations in the genome is very computationally expensive so it's not feasible 
so we need to find a better way to handle the protein to genome alignment and this way also needs to be able to filter out all of the noise in the alignments of especially remote proteins so the way to do this is a prod hint pipeline we developed which approaches the problem of selection of protein coding hints from proteins in four distinct steps. And the first step is to utilize GeneMark ES to get a rough idea about where the proteins can be located. GeneMark ES might not be very accurate, but it's just a heuristic to help us in the selection of possible proteins. Then we cross-reference the predicted proteins against a large protein database, such as OrthoDB which contains millions and millions of proteins and find possible homologs to these proteins. And now that we have possible homologs, we align these proteins back to the genome and we align it in a spliced manner. So the alignment reveals locations of exons, introns and start and stop codons. And once we have all the information about these gene elements, we need to filter them in a way to remove noise, which will be present, especially when the target proteins are very remote with respect to our genome of interest. So to look at how to remove this noise, we need to characterize our introns with some features. So we are using two main features to characterize the quality of each intron and one of the features is intron borders alignment score. So the intron borders alignment score evaluates how good the alignment of a protein to DNA is around intron exon boundaries. And we are using standard Blossom 62 matrix to evaluate the similarity of amino acids. And the property of this score is that it uses a linear kernel, which weights the alignment based on how far it is from an intron exon boundary. So let's imagine the intron is located here between two exons and we are evaluating the quality of an intron by looking at the alignment upstream and downstream of the intron and weighting the alignment by how close to the intron it actually is. So once we weight both of these alignments, we take a geometric mean of these alignments and that's our intron borders alignment score. Another score is called intron mapping coverage and it simply computes from how many distinct proteins we are getting one and the same intron. So we assume that in our input protein set a protein from each species is represented only once and then this gives us an idea from how many distinct species an intron is supported. If we take both of these scores and visualize introns with respect to these scores, we can see that they separate false and true positives really well. So in this graph, we are representing false positives with a purple color and true positives are represented in a green color. And both with increasing borders score and mapping coverage score, we are removing more and more false positives. So if we only take a subset of introns which are found at least in four different proteins and they have a score higher than 0 0.25, we get an extremely confident set of introns, which can be utilized in multiple different ways. For example, we can directly enforce it in our gene predictions because we trust this set so much for the reason, for the following reason. We evaluated our filtering procedure the selection of high confidence introns on multiple different genomes and to give you an example of six different genomes what the sensitivity and specificity of introns found is so we can see that the specificity which is showing how many how pure the set of predictions is so how many true positives compared to false positives there are is almost 100% in all of these genomes. And the sensitivity is also interesting to look at because in this test, we artificially removed all proteins which belonged to the same taxonomical order. So here on input, 
in each case we use orthodb but we removed all proteins all species from the same taxonomical order so proteins that were left were pretty remote from different orders but still we were able to map in some cases up to 80 percent of all entrants in the genome which is quite surprising because from rna seq you can also get maybe up to 80 percent and no more so sometimes proteins can actually give you more information than native RNA-seq data. And to show you this in a bit more detail, we can look at prediction accuracy of GeneMark ES, which is not using proteins at all, compared to GeneMark EP+, which is utilizing the protein information in the way I just described, and compare the accuracy improvement with, with respect to how remote the input proteins are. And what's uh, encouraging result for us is that even when the proteins are coming from a different taxonomical phylum, we still see a significant improvement between prediction accuracy of GMARC ES and prediction accuracy of GMARC EP+. And as you are decreasing the distance, evolutionary distance between your input proteins and your genome of interest, the prediction accuracy is getting better and better. So if you use all of the proteins available, but the proteins of the species itself, because that's our target that we want to annotate, then you can get very high prediction accuracies in comparison with not using proteins at all. So this is my last slide to introduce the algorithm. So I would like to give you a space for some questions before jumping in to the tutorial covering gene mark usage. Hi. Hello. Uh, I was thinking that it would be useful to connect the protein output to the uniprotein protein data band. Um, sorry, did you say how to use uniprot protein data with GeneMark? Yeah, the, the, the GeneMark output to oh, okay. con con connect the output in some way with the PDB server. So you can use it. So your question is not how to utilize proteins for predictions, but to compare the result of gene mark to Uniprot. Uh, do I understand it correctly? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you can use BLAST and you can translate gene mark predictions to proteins. And I will show you how to do it in the tutorial. And then use BLAST-P, which is a protein to protein BLAST, to find similarities between your predictions and proteins in the uniprot. Yeah, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, so if there are no other questions, I will switch to the tutorial. Professor, uh, any questions from your side before we go to the tutorial? No, no. Okay. No questions. Thank you. So for the tutorial, I, I built a website which you can find on this address. I will actually share it in the chat in case you are interested to look at it yourself. And it covers the documentation of GeneMark ES family of algorithms. And it covers many steps, including installation, usage, and how to analyze the output and also some examples of how to annotate genomes from the beginning to end. So I will skip the installation section because I don't have that much time, but I can assure you that all the steps how to install GeneMark ES on your local machines are described in detail in this tutorial. So if you are interested later, you can follow these steps to get it set up on your local Linux machine. What I want to highlight is a section about installation verification 
which basically checks if what you installed is configured correctly. And I'm showing this because maybe 90% of errors we are getting from users are coming from some problem with installation. Usually something is not configured correctly or some dependency is missing. And by running this simple example, which is included in the gene mark ES, you can quickly check if your example small input will be matching the example small output. And if it's matching, then you can be sure that everything is installed correctly. And this example runs in about seven minutes. So I actually run this example every time I make any changes to the code just to verify everything works. So I encourage you to do the same before you jump into actual gene prediction. And now to look at the actual gene prediction. Here in this example, I will be annotating a novel eukaryotic genome. And I will assume that there is no other data available about this genome other than the assembled sequence itself. And for the purpose of this tutorial, I will actually use the genome of Arabidopsis thaliana, which is of course not a novel genome, but we will pretend here that the genome is novel so that we can demonstrate how a novel genome would be annotated by GeneMark. So the tutorial first starts by some instructions on how to download the genome from NCBI. So in this particular case, I'm using the genome release from NCBI and downloading the data from there. And it takes a while to download, so I'm not gonna really show it. What I'm gonna show, which is useful in general, is how to pre-process your genome before starting to use it in gene prediction. So when you download the genome, it will look like this. There will be the FASTA header and there is a bunch of information after the contact name. And this information after a space after the contact name is sometimes problematic. It can cause issues with GMARC, with breaker and so on. So what we want to have are FASTA headers, which are cleaned, which only contain the sequence ID. So they only contain this part. So how to do it is demonstrated in the tutorial. You can just use this simple command to clean up the genome. So I will quickly run this command to see what happens. And this basically removes all the noise which is present in the genome after the FASTA header. And now your header is nice and clean and ready to be annotated. So this is one thing uh, we recommend to do before jumping into the analysis of your data. Another thing is that this particular genome comes with repeat masking. And that can be a good thing if you trust the repeat masking. However, if you don't trust the repeat masking and you want to conduct the repeat masking analysis on your own, which I will show you how to do, you may want to remove the repeats. So to remove the repeats from the genome, you can use this command and I can quickly show you how the result looks when the repeats are present and removed. So with the repeats present, you will see all repeats in lowercase letters. So the non-repetitive regions are uppercase, lowercase letters represent repeats. And after you remove your repeats, the genome should look like this. So as you can see, no lowercase letters are present. And then we can do the repeat masking correctly in a different procedure. I also show steps how to download a reference annotation, which we will use to kind of evaluate how good our prediction is. But don't worry, I will also show ways how to evaluate how good the prediction is when you do not have the reference annotation available, which will be the case in the actual problem of annotating a novel genome. So these steps I'm not gonna show, but they just show you how to get the annotation from NCBI and convert it from GFF format to GTF, which is also the default output of GeneMark so that you can directly compare it 
without any issues. Now, second part of this tutorial is relevant directly for any novel genome. It covers how to download your protein sequences. So like I said, we assume that we don't have any other information than the genome itself available for our novel genome. However, that doesn't mean we cannot utilize cross-species proteins from publicly available databases. So one of these databases is OrthoDB. And in this case, because we know our genome is a plant, we can download all of the plant proteins from OrthoDB. So you would just download it from this link and it would take maybe five minutes to download all of the proteins. It gives you about 4 million protein sequences from over 100 different plants. And what you want to do when you download it, the download folder will look like this. So let me make this a bit bigger. So there will be a folder called raw data. And in this raw data folder, all the protein sequences will be located. So what you want to do is use this command, which is documented on the website, to concatenate all these protein files into one file, which will contain all of the protein sequences from all of the plants. And once you have that, the protein sequences are ready to be used by GeneMark to help you in genome annotation. And there was a question about Uniprot. So the algorithm is not necessarily using OrthoDB. It's the database we tested and we know it works well with OrthoDB, but you can also add your custom proteins to it for example, from Uniprot and use them in exactly the same way to help you to improve your predictions. And what we do in this tutorial to kind of make it a bit fair is we remove proteins from the Arabidopsis genus itself because we wanna see how well we are doing in this example. So just for the purpose of this tutorial, we will be removing proteins from Arabidopsis genus itself, so that we compare the prediction accuracy in a fair way. But this step is only required for this toy example. And in reality, you never want to remove any proteins from your database. You just want to use as much information as you have available. So now that we covered how to get our proteins and how to pre-process the sequence, we can proceed how to mask our genome. So repeat masking is important for two main reasons. One of them was already hinted on by Alex. And Alex stated that there are some transposable elements which contain genes inside them. And these genes are usually not something you want to predict by a eukaryotic gene prediction tool. And moreover, these transposable elements can have a very distinct signature. So it can happen that your algorithm, which is self-training, will converge to predicting mostly these transposable elements rather than through protein coding genes. So what you wanna do with eukaryotic genomes is to remove transposable elements by repeat masking prior to predicting genes. But removing transposable elements is problematic because when you have a novel genome, you don't know what the transposable elements may look like. They are just as species specific as the genes themselves. So that's why we show how to use repeat modeler, which is another tool which is predicting transposable elements from sequence itself, just like GeneMark is predicting genes from sequence itself. And by using repeat modeler, you can build a custom transposable element library just from the sequence itself and then use it with repeat masker, which actually does all of the repeat masking. So these commands, they may take about 10 hours on this particular genome. So I'm not gonna show them, but what you're gonna see after masking the genome with repeat masker, again, you will see some lowercase letters in your sequence, which stand for repeats. And GeneMark will pretty much ignore all of the regions which are lowercase and are longer than some given threshold. So in case of 
Mm -hmm. Shorter eukaryotes, we only ignore, repeats longer than 1000 nucleotides. So probably this region would already be ignored and excluded from the search space in which to predict genes. So now that, now that we reprocessed our genome, masked repeats and got our proteins, we can start the gene prediction itself. And we can either use GeneMark ES, which is using just the sequence alone, or we can use GeneMark EP+, which is gonna use sequence alone and the protein database. And there are really not many options you need to use. The only required option is the sequence alone and the algorithm type. We also wanna make sure the soft masking is recognized by the algorithm. So we just say soft mask and auto option enables you to control when you are ignoring soft mask regions longer than certain length, you can instead of auto specify a number, but if you don't know what you are doing, you just wanna leave it up to the algorithm, you say it's auto. And number of cores just specifies how many multiple cores are gonna be used in parallel. So this will speed up the prediction eight times if you have eight avail available CPUs. So a note on the runtime, this will usually take two and a half hours on a genome of this length, which is about 120 megabytes long. So the runtime of GeneMark ES increases linearly with the genome size. And runtime of GeneMark EP is quite similar, even though it's doing the protein mapping. And in this particular case, it will be mapping proteins from over three or four million plant proteins in OrthoDB. But the procedure has been heavily optimized so that it won't take longer than two hours. So by adding proteins, you are only increasing runtime by about two hours in this case. And this tutorial covers how to use GeneMark EP plus either with a simple command, or if you are interested in more details, you can actually run the protein mapping pipeline called prodhint separately to get first the protein hints and then you can plug in the protein hints in the algorithm. So maybe you are interested in just the protein hints on the hints to intron starts and stops alone, not really in the gene prediction itself. And in that case, you may want to run just prodhint or you may want to run prodhint with some specific options, control the E value of the similarity of the predictions and so on. So then that's another use case when you want to split this command into two different commands to give you a bit more control over what you are doing. So now that we covered how to predict genes, the most interesting part is how to evaluate your predictions. So the prediction output will be a GTF file, just like in prokaryotic genomes, the structure is the same. You have the contact coordinates of genes and also some more information, just gene ID, which is internal to gene marks. So all elements with the same gene ID, they correspond to the same genes. And then some more details, for example, with exons, you can see if the exon is internal, initial or terminal and so on. So this gives you a bunch of information. And because the reference annotation is organized in the same way, you can use it to compare the prediction set directly to the annotated set of genes. So the annotation set we consider it to be the ground truth in, the, in this case, we believe in what annotation is telling us in this case. So we may want to look into how well the algorithm did. So let's assume we have the annotation or we have another gene set available. So to compare how well we did, we can use this command and directly compare our result against annotation. So here we will be computing how many exons exactly match exons in annotation. And we can see that 81% exons present in annotation are also present in our predictions. And also that our predictions have 
84% specificity. If you look at absolute numbers, we can see that out of 156,000 exons in annotations, we predicted 127 correctly. And we also predicted about 23,000 false positives. This comparison can be done not just on exon level, but we can also ask how many genes exactly match. And we would just replace the CDS flag with gene flag. And this would show us that our predictions are predicting 72% of genes present in annotation with 70% specificity. So this is a way to compare your result if you have a reference annotation available but most of the time we will not. So there is another script which will automatically generate an annotation report similar to the one Alex presented for prokaryotes. And all you need to do is to type in this command prediction report, then you wanna supply the gene mark output and also the final model of gene mark. The report then saves the output to a specified file and it will look like this. So it will summarize how many genes were found, what was the average number of introns per gene, how many genes are supported by external evidence and how many genes are fully predicted without any protein or RNA-seq support. And I will come to this point later, so let's just skip it for now. And it also generates distributions of predicted genes. So we can see what is the average gene length what is the average exon length, which is split between initial exon length, which tends to be shorter compared to internal exon length, as you can see, and terminal exons. Then the length of single exon genes, again, will differ from lengths of internal and terminal exons. We can take a look at the histogram of number of exons per gene, how the intron lengths are distributed, what is the distribution of intergenic length. And also it can be interesting to take a look at the motifs discovered by the algorithm. So it gives you information about start motifs, donor motifs and introns, acceptor motifs and stop color motif. So all this could be useful and I will also compared motifs found in plant genome compared to motifs found in fungal genomes and you will see they are indeed very different. So this report can help you to kind of judge how good your annotation is when you have some expectations. So you may expect to find about 20,000 genes with certain gene lengths and this report can quickly visualize if your result matches your expectations. Another way to evaluate your predictions when you don't have any information is to use Busco. And Busco is a tool to evaluate the completeness of your gene set. And the way Busco is built is authors of Busco took orthodb proteins and they pretty much looked into what proteins are found in every plant genome. Then they went into more specific families and they asked what proteins are found in every uh, genome in a specific gene family. And in the end, what you want to see is that you predicted all of the expected genes. So I will skip the technical details of this because we are running out of time. But what this will show us that we selected the family in which Arabidopsis thaliana is located because we have this information. Let's say we know to which family our genome belongs. If you don't know, if you are not sure, we can use just all the plant proteins to do this analysis. And the analysis shows us that out of 4,596 expected genes in our set, we predicted 4,534. So we predicted 98.7% of expected genes, which is a very good sign if you know nothing about the genome now you know that out of the expected genes, you predicted about 99%, which may suggest that in the rest of the genes, which you don't know nothing about, that they are likely to be correct as well, because you are already catching 
all of the expected genes. So that's another way to analyze, analyze the prediction quality and especially to analyze sensitivity. Because if you are over predicting genes and you are predicting many false positives, you can still get a good Busco score because you still predict all the expected genes, but then a big number of false positives. And to deal with the second problem of predicting too many false positives, you can use another script, which is located in the GMARC ES suite. And this script selects genes which are supported by external evidence. So let's say you have used proteins on input to help your predictions. And then you predicted a set of genes and some of these genes are fully supported by the proteins you used. And some of, the genes are, some of these genes are partially supported and some of the predictions do not match the proteins at all. So you can choose the script, run it and get three sets of predictions. One, which will contain only predictions which have some match to your protein or RNA-seq data, depends in which mode you run the algorithm. Then you get another set which has all of the gene structures supported by your external evidence. And this set tends to be the most reliable one, but also it comes at the cost of losing some correct predictions. And then you also get a set which are purely computational predictions which do not have any support by external proteins as well. So if you look at numbers here, we had about 20,000 genes predicted. And by filtering out genes which do not have any support, we lost 314 genes, but we also removed about 3,000 false positives. If we are more stringent and we require that all of our predicted genes have full support, then we removed 7,000 false positives. So our set is now very confident. It has almost no false positives, but we also lost about 1,500 correctly predicted genes. So here you see you have kind of two ways to evaluate sensitivity. And this is a way to not really evaluate, but to ensure specificity of your predictions. So with this, this concludes annotation of one novel genome. So please, if there are any questions before I show you how to do the same for a fungal genome, let me know. Does everyone feel confident they will be able to annotate a genome with this set of instructions? So I'm gonna take this as a yes and jump to annotating a fungal genome, which is quite similar to what I just shown but I want to highlight some differences. So this tutorial covers an annotation of a fungal genome as Pombe. And first it starts with the same instructions, how to download the genome from NCBI and how to get the proteins. So I'm going to skip this. And one important point for fungal genomes is that the repeat masking is not as crucial as it is for other eukaryotes because fungal genomes are short and compact and they do not contain as many repeats as other eukaryotes. So the situation here is kind of more similar to prokaryotes and you can safely skip the repeat masking step and just proceed with the annotation without masking repeats. So that's one big difference. Another difference is whenever you are predicting a fungal genome, you need to tell GeneMark that it's a fungal genome so all you need to do is to add a flag minus minus fungus and it will now treat it with the special fungal submodel. So now it will give you some prediction results and the annotation report for fungal genomes looks a bit different than for other eukaryotes because it contains the information about the fungal submodel. And what I mean by this 
is that on top of all the information found in our plant genome, we also see what is the estimated branch point motif and what's the estimated distribution of the distance of branch point motif to the except. So this is the main difference between plant genome and fungal genome. And we can see that the motifs which were learned about the genome are quite different. So let's take a look at the donor site. This is in Arabidopsis. And then we can take a look at the donor site in Espomba and you can see it has a very different signature. So the algorithm adapted to the specific genome in this case, which is good. And now I wanted to discuss a special case of a fungal genome which has very low number of introns. And this is kind of an interesting example because the genome of yeast of s service AI contains only 270 introns. And th this poses a big challenge for the family of gene mark algorithms. And you can run the prediction steps exactly in the same way, but the problem will be the accuracy will be quite low. In case of GMARC ES, it won't predict almost any introns. And on the other hand, GMARC EP plus will tend to significantly over predict the number of introns in the genome. So this is an active problem which we are working on. And we, we know what is the reason behind these issues. So let me just illustrate to you why this is difficult. It's because there is so little introns, only 270, while in, let's say, in Ataliana, we had over 100,000 introns, and even in Espomba, we had tens of thousands of introns. So in this genome with only 270 introns, the motif which is discovered by GeneMark ES is very weak. This motif actually does not match the correct motif at all, and the distance of the motif from the acceptor, the distribution clearly has some issues. You do not expect three peaks. You want to see one or maximum two peaks, but no, not this strange distribution. So the motif was not discovered by Jim Marquez. As a result, it did not predict almost an entrance. On the other hand, Jim EP, it discovered a very strong motif and discovered the correct motif actually. So this signal, the consensus sequence of this motif is the same as you would expect. And the spacer duration also looks a bit better. There are kind of two strange peaks, but overall the distribution is much more smooth. But because there is only 270 introns and the motif is very strong, the algorithm suffers from the opposite problem. Now it starts to predict introns all over the genome with a strong branch point motif because it's not able to understand there should only be 270. So it predicts actually about 1500 introns and it disrupts many otherwise good predictions which shouldn't contain any introns. So this is an active area of development. So I wanted to illustrate that not everything is solved and that there are still some issues. Speaking of issues, I may come back to this after the break presentation if we have time, but just for your reference, when you run GeneMark, you often run into some trouble. So I compiled a list of common issues which can be encountered when running GeneMark on this site. So you might want to come to this later or when you actually run GeneMark and encounter problems and describes in short what the error message is and what's likely the cause of the problem, and how to solve it. So one of the problems you can run into is when you supply protein or RNA-seq data, but you supply too little protein or RNA-seq data. So the self-training procedure when it's selecting training genes does not have enough data for the selection. And this usually causes the algorithm to fail. And there are some recommendations. You can decrease the internal thresholds GeneMark will be using for selecting of the external data. So 
you kind of relax the thresholds which are used for the data or you just want to in, increase the amount of proteins or RNA seq data you have available. So errors like this are described on this page and you can use it as a reference whenever you are actually using the algorithm. So this concludes the section about gene mark alone. And in the last half an hour, I will try to quickly introduce you to Breaker, which combines GMARC with Augustus, another gene prediction algorithm. But before doing that, please let me know if you have any questions or just let me know if you feel confident about using GeneMark and installing it and understanding all the different options for fungal, other eukaryotes and so on. Okay, so bye Florencia and thank you for the comments that everything was clear. Now I will go back to my presentation and introduce you to Breaker. But do you think we should take a little break or just finish the session? What do you think? Yeah, just take four minutes break. Okay. Six, let's, let's start at six. Time, okay. Yeah.